Oh, we could keep kibitzing all morning. Are you kidding? <laughs> we've, been, we've, been kibitz, we've been kibitzing all year. What do you mean all morning? <laughs> all right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, morning Mort. Um, everyone have a great day. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. Yeah, Brian. Bye. Uh, um, everybody, have, everybody that's leaving, have a good day. And Mort, you're going to give us a lecture today? I'm yeah. not lecturing. This is going to be a discussion. Wonderful. I love your discussions. You uh, love this more than I do. <laughs> uh, first of all, um, to wrap up the discussions that we'll be having over the last uh, eons, um, does anybody have any final questions on what we were doing with the use of electricity and electronic devices? No? Okay. Um, I, that was a, uh, started off as what we thought would be a uh, simple question that lasted, what, about so far six weeks? <coughs> um, and that's fine. I enjoyed that. Um, I promised that after we finished that, we would go into the teshuva about using Zoom on, on Shabbat. Um, but I'm going to postpone that. Um, as some of you know, this uh, past Shabbat, um, I was involved in an international Tavar Torah. Um, in other words, <clears throat> my son and I uh, had a little dialogue about a passage in uh, the Torah reading from Shabbat, and he was up in Toronto. We did it for his congregation up in Tor Toronto. So that makes it international. Of course, uh, we try to make it uh, really international, but my daughter in London forgot about it and didn't tune in. Uh, but in any event, um, I, I want to go back to that, to that question because I thought it was a, uh, it's a very good one. Um, we based the Devar Torah on a passage from uh, Devarim, chapter 24. Uh, which one is it? This one. Okay, can everybody see where it says yes. sins, of, sins of the fathers? Yes. Okay, hold on one second. Let me just get you big enough so I can see everyone. <clears throat> okay. Um, actually, I, I just I want to add before we get to this part of the text. Um, usually, when I talk about Deuteronomy 24, I'm usually uh, referring to the first part of the chapter, um, which says a man takes a wife, and possesses her, she fails to please him because he finds something obnoxious and he writes her a get. Well, actually it says a bill of divorcement. Um, but since that's been, uh, since I talk about that one all the time, and if you guys haven't heard, heard me talk about that, you know, you're lucky. Uh, that means that you haven't needed uh, the services that I provide and keep it up. Um, <laughs> But in any event, um, I'll move on from that. And we come to verse 16. Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. Okay? Any reactions to that? It seems uncommonly... Uh... <clears throat> uncommonly kind. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you're being so tame today. What? <laughs> Give him a chance. <laughs> <laughs> it's still early. <laughs> uh, now, this is a clearly a troublesome um, passage. Um, but the thing is, it's not the only one. And the um, others are worse. 
Well, no, they're, they're actually not, but we'll get into that. Um, well, the Deuteronomy one contradicts the, the Exodus and Numbers one, so it's probably... Hold on, hold on, we'll get to it. Hold on, we'll get to it. Um, no, I was going to say, it was probably put there on purpose to make sure that, you know, you don't do what, what it says. Well, about. they were all put there on purpose, and we'll, that would be our conclusion. Um, <laughs> and amen. Um, if we look through some of the commentators, and we want to, uh, to understand what this means. And to me, in a uh, natural fashion, what they do is try to limit the scope of what the text says. Uh, you know, we've seen so many times that the rabbis look at a passage and, and then say, no, we really can't use this as a universal maxim. Let's, you know, cut it back to... Um, to a smaller scope. Uh, for example, on this passage, Rashi looks at it and says very simply, the father shall not be put to death on the testimony of the children. You know, saying that this is limited only to uh, issues that come up before the court, and especially in, you know, capital cases. Um, and the conclusion is, is that it, 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 the court cannot put to, you know, the, the parents or the children to death because of the other, because it's only up to, uh, to God to make that final decision, and it's not ours to make. Uh, the Ebenezer Ezra even goes to say, this question is pointless, uh, because the Torah is telling us how God acts, not, it's not ours to question it, nor is it to, uh, to, to deal with it in any other way. Uh, and then we get to our, the Eitz Chaim, you know, the Chumash that we use. And it says, punishment is solely divine prerogative. Uh, wait a minute, I don't think this, I wrote it down and I don't think. Uh, This is the punishment meted out by God. No descendants of an offender is is solely uh, punishment to, uh, by God to a descendant of an offender, and is solely the divine prerogative. Human authorities may not act likewise. Ancient Near Eastern law at times viewed members of a man's family as extensions of his personality, rather than as individuals in their own right. Thus, if a man harmed a member of another's family, he is punished by the same harm being done to a member of his own family, often the corresponding member. member. Also, an offender's family might be punished along with him. There is no explicit prohibition of this in the laws, law codes of ancient Near East before Deuteronomy. Okay, so that's going to that's going to be, that brings up a, a theme that I'll come back to. But first, <clears throat> I want to look at the other texts that have similar passages. So first, we talk, we turn to Exodus 34. Uh, you have it on your screen here keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of, of, of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Um, this passage, or the part that comes right before it, will be repeating during the high holidays innumerable times, uh, it's the one where we say it's the 13 attributes of God. Uh, it starts Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum, Bechanun, Erech, Apayim, Rafes, etc. And if we would keep going in the, from the text, I mean, that's verse 6 in chapter 34. And this sentence comes right after that. Uh, let me see if I can make this just a tad bigger. And, 
what I did instead of going and, and copying what Eitz Chaim said, um, I just took a picture of it. Uh, here, this, this will get bigger. Okay. These two verses contain a passage recited and chanted on the high holy days and festivals. The summary of God's, well, that's just what I said, 13 attributes. Visits the iniquity of the parents upon children and children's children. Bothered by the apparent unfairness of the text, a Hasidic interpretation takes it to mean that God holds parents responsible for not giving their children a proper religious and moral upbringing. We recognize the unfairness of such punishment, yet it is true that the bad habits of parents are too often repeated by their children, for whom parents are their primary role models. So again, I think what the commentators are doing is trying to uh, limit what the text is saying and put it down to a way that we might find would be a reasonable and acceptable, accepted explanation uh, to something that we really find uh, hard to really comprehend. Okay? More? Yeah. Got, got a question. Um, <clears throat> looking at the unbolded portion of this, uh, this uh, verse, it's got me a little confused. Uh, it says, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but who will no, by no means clear the guilty. So what kind of guilt is not cleared if God is understood to be forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin? And then repeating the word iniquity in the, the beginning of the bolded phrase. Well, it's my bold. I understand that. Okay. But whether, I, I'm just using that as a placeholder. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, it says I mean, forgiving it, iniquity and then said visiting the iniquity of, of the fathers of the, it, there seems to be a contradiction there. Oh yeah, you think. Uh, <laughs> um, I, there's um, contradictions all over the place here. Uh, yeah, that's the whole issue. Um, the sentence seems to have some internal contradictions. It's, um, it contradicts what we just read from uh, from Deuteronomy. Um, more, more. I think. Uh, I mean, my reading of, of Exodus thirty four seven uh, kind of boils down to God uh, forgives but doesn't forget that uh, the he who commits the sin perhaps will be forgiven, but um, but the stain of that may may. Uh, be, be transmitted down to the third and fourth generation. I mean, I, look, all, all of this, it, it sounds, I mean, people are reading things into this, people like Rashi, reading things into this that it's really hard to find in here. Uh, so I'm, I thought I would do the same. Well, no, <laughs> no, uh, I, uh, you're, right on, you're right on target with some of this. As a matter of fact, the, <laughs> The way we generally look at this, though, is, is to talk about teshuva. And if a person does teshuva, then God is forgiving. I mean, that's why we use this, you know, this so much on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, but it's saying if a person doesn't do that teshuva, whether it's ben adam ledam or ben adam makom, in other words, between, between individuals or between uh, between us and God, then if they don't, then that iniquity continues through, the, it's saying it's continued through the third and fourth generation. And that's how we generally look at it, okay? Mm -hmm. And that, and the same thing goes for uh, Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, if you do teshuva forgiving iniquity and transgression, but it by no means clear, clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation. Um, I should add that, by the way, uh, 
the first text, Exodus 34, uh, in context, uh, that is coming right after the golden calf. It's when, um, when, when Moshe comes down, sees what they're doing with the calf, breaks these tablets, and then goes up to get the second tablets, and then this is what um, comes right in the Torah right after that. Uh, numbers uh, 14, 18. Let me find, find that for a second here. Hold on. Okay. Um, this is coming uh, after the spies come back uh, from touring the, the, the land and they give the, uh, their report and the people get all upset and uh, are ready to rebel. And um, the response is, you know, but God is slow to anger and abounding in kindness. And it says, when, why does God who forgave Israel for the golden calf and other acts of faithfulness condemn to death an entire generation for this offense? God is prepared to forgive such slights against heaven, but not sins against the idea of the Jewish people as the people of God, which is one interpretation. Okay. Um, and by the way, in these two passages, or all the passages, every time it mentions the word children, the ancient Aramaic versions always understand this as rebellious children. You know, um, remember there is the passage about um, the stubborn and rebellious son, <coughs> which we had earlier in Deuteronomy. Um, so there's clearly, you know, these passages which talk about the third and fourth generation. And it seems, you know, we have to do all this sort of dancing around to really try to understand it. Um, but uh, I just want to mention briefly that both versions of the Ten Commandments, both in, in Shemot and in Devarim, uh, both have it. You should not bow down to other gods or serve them. I'm the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Okay. Um, you skipped over that uh, the box that I was going to ask you about the twenty three twenty four. That's up a little bit. Yeah. Twenty two twenty three. Oh, you read it, but that line co contradicts itself. They, he forgives Israel, then he kills them. <laughs> well, again, he forgives them as a whole, but then if they come up with a different transgression, whammo. All right. Okay. Well, I don't understand the idea of the sins against the idea of the Jewish people as the people of God. What's a sin against the idea of the Jewish people as the people of God? Well, remember, first of all, I, I'm not sure who the specter is, but uh, I that, that's his comment. Um, but I take that to mean that here, God has forgiven the people. Now, the spies have come back and given a report. And again, they're saying, you know, who is this God that's, you know, monkeying around with us? So again, they're going after it. You know, here, we, we had the sense that with the giving of the Ten Commandments, we have become a, we've become a people. Um, we have now a covenantal relationship with God. And these guys came along and uh, gave a report, and the people are just way off, you know, you know, taken off again, and rejecting this peoplehood, rejecting the word of God, and going off on it. That's how I say that. I see that. Okay, but now let let me turn to something else here. I'm going to look at a 
passage from the Talmud, from the Tractate of Makot. And it says here that there are four times that Moshe gave a commandment and the prophets came along and rejected it. it came up with a decree that nullified what it is in the text. I'm going to look, unless you want to get into the other three, I'm going to look only at the one that I've highlighted. Moshe said, he visits the transgressions of the fathers upon the sons. Ezekiel came and revoked it. The soul that sins, it shall die, which it says in Ezekiel 18, and not the children of that soul. Okay? So, in, in Makot, we see that Ezekiel, the, the rabbis accept the fact that Ezekiel is going to nullify all of this. Okay? What do we mean by that? Hold on one second here. Let me see what I have here. All right. All right. So let me go and point out what it says exactly in Ezekiel. Okay. Um, Ezekiel is going to argue against the notion that the sins of the father of the parents are taken out on the children. He is going to go against the idea embodied in that statement. He is not there to, uh, to correct or argue with the text itself. He does not question that, but he wants to get to the response. And it says at the beginning of Ezekiel, the word of God came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are blunted. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Okay? So, um, Ezekiel is going to reject what we refer to, or has been referred to, the sour grapes theology. Anybody ever heard that term? Frankly, I hadn't heard about it until last week either, but I love it. Uh, sour grapes theology is just as it says, you know, parents eat sour grapes, the children's teeth rot. In other words, the parents do something and the children suffer. Um, as uh, my son and I discussed, you know, Saturday, yes, there, there are some times when children are influenced by the, by the parents, and there are times when uh, the children take on certain habits and, or characteristics that they see in their parents and will continue them and take them on as their own. And if that's the case, um, they are deserving of quote unquote punishment. Um, I say that they're deserving because they have taken it on as their own personal choice. Uh, let me finish the sentence. They have opted to do what they're doing and the parents are not controlling them. Okay, yes, Doug. You're on mute, Doug. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, you're, you're, you're making the, the nurture argument, but there's also a nature argument here. I mean, there is, there is a certain Mendelian rationality um, to this approach, especially if you're talking early in the early generations of what is expected to become a great nation. I know that's harsh, but I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're saying that, that the, the children are gonna be affected by what they observe in the behavior of their parents, but they may be fundamentally affected 
by the genetic makeup of the parents that's been transmitted to them? Um, there may be some of that, but I, even taking genetics into account, I think that there, it reaches a point where we could say, well, that you inherited from your father, or yet you inherited from your mother. Um, but it reaches the point where that only goes so far. Uh, I, you know, I don't think any, I don't know of anybody uh, that is a complete clone of their parent. Uh, it, 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 you're, you're absolutely correct. But I mean, if you, if you look at um, agricultural development and, and uh, uh, animal husbandry, uh, if you're if you're trying to breed for an optimal set of characteristics, you call your flock. I, you know, I gotta say, I always wonder if that's of even what all these uh, animal husbands do. If they're really, you know, are they are they really that successful in in in, in breeding for certain characteristics? You know, Absolutely. really sure, sure. I, you know, I know a lot of people believe it, but I, 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 I really, in some ways, question it. Um, okay. You know, you know if uh, everybody wants to breed from the winner of the triple crown, you know, why don't, why do we uh, not have a triple crown winner every year? It takes a little longer than that. Well, it takes things other than just being bred. That's my point. Okay. Uh, I think I missed a transition here somewhere. I don't, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how we got into animal husbandry, but it seems to me that, that the idea of, of, of the sins, you know, whether the sin should be visited on future generations doesn't have to, it, it, it need not do with um, a choice, certainly on the part of the children, nor need it have to do with genetics. I think, you know, uh, for example, an abusive parent uh, is very likely to have an abusive, eventually an abusive child. Uh, you know, the child will grow up and that's what that child learned. And I, I don't think that's a choice and I don't think it's genetics. I think it's simply, um, this, is, this is what somebody lives with and this is what somebody becomes. I agree with that. I agree with it only to a certain extent. Um, and, th and that, uh, I don't argue with some of the statistics that said, if a parent is abusive, the child will find that there is a certain acceptance uh, or a certain normality to being abusive himself or herself. But, not everyone does that. So therefore, I wouldn't come up with it as a generalized statement. There are, uh, there's people have the ability to say, I realize that I was abused, and therefore I will not do that to my children. But not everybody has that ability. Um, not everybody does it. Oh, well, I agree they, with that. Not everybody does it, but whether some, why some do and, and some don't. You know, and there could, be, there could be a whole bunch of reasons why they don't do it. Right. One is that they don't know they can. Uh, do they have the ability to do so if it was pointed out to them? I would like to say yes. Um, but again, we're generalizing with a lot of things here. And, um, you know, anything that we say, I'm sure I can find exceptions to. Um, but, but I think, you know, the, the, what we want to say here is that children ultimately, uh, have some control over their own destiny. Um, that's the whole point of us saying that we have free will. Um, not everything is determined for us by our parents or what our parents happened to do or not do, or what other people thought of what our parents did or didn't do. Okay, with this idea of the punishment going to the, to the children or to the third and fourth generation. But, well, I wanna get back to Ezekiel here. And 
by the way, that what I read was the first part of chapter, uh, what was it, 18? And at the end of chapter 18, uh, Ezekiel says, yet you say, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? When the son has done what is lawful and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. The person who sins shall die. A child shall not suffer for the iniquity of a parent, nor a parent suffer for the iniquity of a child. The righteousness of the righteous shall be his own, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be his own. Okay. Um, so, I, 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 Ezekiel comes to reject the sour grapes theology and, and really say everyone is rewarded for what they do or don't do on their own. If, even though it's, and the rabbis say all along, even though it says the iniquity be visited to the third and fourth generation, if the generation is righteous, they aren't, they don't receive the punishment. You know, and, and one of the things that occurs to me is that if this does go, um, if this, if this was to be true, that everyone would suffer from the iniquities of the parents and it would become, a, you know, how would any of us have any hope of having a decent life? I mean, um, I think my father, my, my, my grandfather was known to be a very righteous man. I don't know anything about his father, so that would be four and three generations back for me, and I have no idea about the fourth generation that were in Europe. Um, am I bearing them all? And I, I think, you know, to me, it seems that that doesn't play out in reality. But what we, what we do understand, it, what we can understand, that Ezekiel lived in the time that the Torah was, the Torah text was undergoing its final redaction. For those of us who want to believe that there was an editing process in putting together the Torah text. So by his rejecting sour grapes, it influenced the text. Thus we have the sentences that we've just been looking at, which talk about only the, I'm gonna say only the third and fourth generation. Remember what I read from the Eitz Chaim Let me go back to it here. I close that page, but I have it here. Um, the ancient Near Eastern law at times viewed members of a man's family as extensions of his personality rather than as individuals in their own right. Thus, if a man harmed a member of another's family, he was punished by the same harm being done to a member of his own family, often the corresponding number. So, in ancient Near East law, they believed in sour grapes. Yechezkel is coming here and saying, hey, stop this, we're not going to believe in this anymore. And so, in the text, when it talked about the golden calf and the reports, the reaction to the reports of the spies, what we read, and, in, and when I said before, emphasizing the only, shows that our view of what God is doing here is, is kind and it is, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, he's, he's, I have to put it a different way because I can't think of the word. But what it's showing that, in, well, I'm twisting over my own self. All right, let me go back again. What we want to say here is that in applying the, the sour grapes in any way that peoples did before, uh, before this time was unlimited. When it said that the family, if we harmed the family or we've, or, you know, in, in our parlance would commit a sin, then 
people believed that that punishment could be meted out to the other, the other family as long as we needed to do it. We're now going to come along and say, we're going to limit what could be done only to the third and fourth generation, not any farther. Um, that was actually a compromise. That's the compromise they did in the text to, to limit the, you know, God's anger and what we saw as God's anger and God's way of punishing the rest of the family for what a certain member would, would do. And then we even came and say, okay, you know, then, you know, Devorim comes later on. And if, if it follows what Yecheskel is saying here, do away with this whole, you know, type of thinking. Then it puts in this passage that we find in, in chapter 24. Children should not be put to death because of the, of the parents. Parents not because of children or I think the, the text actually is the other way around. Yes, Sue? I'm wondering, do, is there any rabbinic commentary on like saying, well, uh, let's say uh, on Eze related to the Ezekiel text that says, well, not so quick. You know, it, there really is an influence from one generation to the other. Influence, probably. Okay, well, what, what, is there anything that, that sort of gives Ezekiel not a free hand to just come off and change it? Not that I know of, because I think, I think everybody is trying to agree with Ezekiel and saying, okay. especially, especially, you know, I think Ezekiel is saying, don't punish the kids because of the parents. Now, if, if the thinking, okay. if they, if the children do the same thing, then they're... Yeah, if, if the kids do it again, that's on them. Right, okay. If they got that, if they got that sense of abuse from the parents, well, that's, that giving it to the children, that's on the parents. But the kids following through, that's on them. Okay. Go ahead, Art. Uh, I, well, I'm, I'm wondering about what seems like a, an equivalence being set up between the sins of the father being visited being visited on the child and the sins of the child being visited on the father. It, it seems that, I mean, I can think of many cases where the sins of the child should be visited on the father. Um, and, and I'm just, is, is that? Give me an example. Well, if, if, if a child is, um, is known to uh, be, be engaging in criminal behavior and the parent is told about it and says, you know, you've got to stop, you know, your child is, is out of hand and you've getting, you need to do something. And the, the parent uh, condones it and doesn't do anything about it. It seems like if, if uh, the parent ought to be, uh, bear, ought to bear some responsibility for that behavior. Sure. But the responsibility is not because of what the child did or is about to do. The responsibility is on the parent for not acting. Those are two separate acts. Okay. You know, I, you know, I want to go out and rob a bank. I tell my father, I'm going to go rob a bank. And he says, all right, go ahead. You know, share the wealth with me. Legally, isn't there some, it, just in our system, isn't there some responsibility if you know that someone is about to commit a crime. It's like, it's like a bartender who doesn't, who keeps serving yeah. drinks after you're, you're right. uh, visibly drunk. Yeah, there's some liability. But again, those are two different acts. Getting, drunk, getting drunk is one <laughs> thing. Not telling the drunk to stop or, telling any, or taking the drunk's keys away, that's a second act. Well, there's, there's another example that's actually a real world circumstance. Um, I forget what state it is, um, but it has to do with one of the candidates where parents can be thrown in jail for their kids' repeated truancy. Right. Or allowing drugs at a party. Uh, uh, well, it used to be liquor. Allowing yeah, liquor at a party when the kids are underage. But that's with, with knowledge. 
Okay, the 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 question of cutting of cutting school, you know, you can get thrown in jail even if you weren't aware of it. Well, you well, could argue reckless disregard in that case that that you should yeah. have been aware of it. You know, we are <laughs> we have uh, we have left out of this conversation <laughs> so far the sense that if someone is in is a minor the parents have a certain responsibility okay um and so i think given doug's question we need to recognize that even that is part of the halakhic system and that's you know how many bar, bar and bat mitzvah kids have gotten up there and say now i'm responsible you know do they even know what that means? I don't know. But in any event, um, and I think that the, um, you know, we'll have to ask some of the lawyers that are here with us. Uh, I, I think this idea of the parents being punishment for the truancy of the kids uh, comes, I would, I would say probably comes under the rubric of a parent having certain responsibility for a minor. But once a, um, I, I would say though that what we're really dealing with is is when a kid is a major or reaches majority, isn't that, isn't that the way that we should really say that? Okay, does that make sense, Doug? Yes, it does. Yes. It does to me too. <laughs> okay. Um, you have to leave. But um, everyone have a good day. Thank you, David. Yeah, I got to go too, actually. I have to go to work. <laughs> yeah. My computer. I, I, just, I just posted no. a chat note. I'm out of here too. I'm going to yeah. help. Well, that's good because I think I finally ran out of, you know, what we need to say about this. But um, <laughs> I have a quick question. Mort, I have a quick question. Go ahead, Elkin. Okay. I'm thinking of the story from where this began. Was this whole thing about, you know, fathers and children related to anything in other cultures in the Middle East that were doing the opposite? Yeah, Maybe exactly. Exactly. So the, so it's the same like the Akeda, right? The Akeda is a sign of against, uh, you know, slaughtering your, ch slaughtering your children to serve a higher purpose, higher God, right? Okay, yeah. Is this the same basic theme that? Well, I, yeah, I mean, it says it quite explicitly. That's what we're yeah. talking. About. That's what we're talking about. If the other people have had what we've now come to the refer to as the sour grapes theology, uh, yeah, that you know that uh, exactly is coming. I mean, you know, uh, Yechesio is very explicit on that. He says. Okay. Don't use this proverb anymore. It's it's not to be used by you. Uh, <laughs> and this whole way of thinking is not what we wanna wanna do. All right. So that that was good. Oh, you have, I have to go with your Haskell now. Okay. Okay. Right. I gotta go. Also. Uh, everybody, okay. This is a really in, interesting. Yeah. See y'all. So, All right. I, this, actually. I, I think now you guys see why I wanted to go back over this again, um, even though it was out of our uh, out of our agenda. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Mort. It was All great. Right. Stuff. We, had, we had a lot of fun Saturday. You know, of no, course, just, yeah. for a small show, they had really big attendance. I mean, really? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know their exact membership, but there were there was uh, I think seventy three screen, uh, screens on the on the Zoom. Ooh. Now take away the three that were um, my son in Roanoke, my daughter in New York, and myself. That is seventy is still a hefty amount. That's good. Oh, yeah. Sure. Right. This is this is a Wernick synagogue, right? It's not Steve Wernick synagogue. No. Oh no. No. Okay. No, it's actually a reconstruction synagogue. Oh, okay. All right. Your, your kids are diverse. <laughs> you bet. That's great. All right, everybody. Oh, oh, All right. uh, David. 
Uh, what are we doing about next week? It's, uh, it's Labor Day. Uh, that's totally up to you. I, I, usually, the, these days, uh, attendance doesn't drop that much because people at the shore still call in. But, uh, but it's totally up to you. All right, I, uh, I'll be here. Uh, if people are around and want to stay around, okay. uh, I'll prepare something. Uh, if okay. they're not around, we'll postpone it a week. I have no problems. Okay, that, that sounds great. Um, it's, I'm waiting for you to complain about the titles that I give your, uh, your tour study on the, the, uh, the, the uh, I, I, virtual BZBI. I, I, it's taken me a while to, to get used to it. Um, and uh, if, it's, I, if know, they're too and flippant, time, just let me know. I, every time I think to say something, you're not around. <laughs> um, but, but by the way, I want this one to be called Sour Grapes. Oh, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna do this one as, um, will your children suffer if you watch Zoom on Shabbat? Uh. <laughs> no, so, I, sour grapes, it is. Sour grapes. Sour grapes. <laughs> okay. okay. Take care, everyone. Okay. Okay. Bye. See you more. <laughs>